So, colleagues, uh, welcome to the Heliophysics and Space Geophysics Seminars promoted by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research and the Galileo Solar Space Telescope Working Group. In particular, this seminar is hosted by the Space Geophysics, Geophysics Postgraduate Program and by the Research in Heliophysics Project sponsored by CAPS, a Brazilian funding agency. Our guest today is Dr. Alfred Devin from the High Altitude Observatory of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Devin received his PhD in astrophysics in 2006 from the Utrecht University. He began working at the High Altitude Observatory in December 2006. His research has always been focused on observational studies and magnetism and the dynamics of the photosphere, chromosphere, and transition region. More recently, he has taken interest in polarimetry and instrumentation, as several of us, and he is currently the instrument scientist for several projects at the High Altitude Observatory. So, on behalf of the INPI, I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Devine, for accepting our invitation to present the seminar on measuring solar magnetism with the visible spectropolarimeter on the Daniel Inouye Solar Observatory, which is, of course, a topic of central interest of our research activities at INC. We just ask the audience to keep the mute their microphones during the presentation. And if you have questions, you can write down at the chat, chat and or ask later in the end. So thank you very much, Alfred. You. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I probably won't be looking at the chat. So uh, uh, if you have a question, I don't mind being interrupted um, or uh, save them up for later and uh, we can go through them after. So thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's nice to give a talk again. It's been a really long time. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about measuring solar magnetism with, uh, with VISP on the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. And it's a very exciting time because um, the, the Inouye Solar Telescope is obviously a very big step towards uh, a new generation of very large telescopes um, for solar physics. Uh, solar research, and they are actually starting their operations today. Uh, I've learned that they're uh, uh, they're beginning their their operations phase, and um, they're kind of uh, doing some some checks out checkouts today. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting time. Um, in the very near future, we're going to start seeing uh, actual science data come off this telescope, and people are going to start working with it. So that's uh, that's great. Um, Developing the VISP has been a really long effort. It's, uh, I've been working on this for probably more than a decade now. Uh, I've got my name on this presentation, but obviously there's a long list of people that have contributed to the VISP, uh, not the least of which is actually here today. Roberto Cassini is the PI, um, and maybe he would have been a good person to ask for this talk, uh, but you know, you're gonna have to do with me today. So um, you might be wondering, Wait, um, this guy is at a Center for Atmospheric Research, and, and that's true. The, the National Center for Atmospheric Research does uh, research in um, you, uh, uh, about the, the Earth's atmosphere. And um, it has a group that studies the sun, which I'm part of, um, since the sun is a major driver on the Earth's atmosphere. So um, you can think about things like atmospheric photochemistry, for instance, is driven uh, considerably by um, UV radiation from the sun. Uh, also space weather. Um, I've plunked in this little picture over here, which shows a, a very threatening solar flare uh, making its way towards Earth. And, and um, you can see sort of the, the, the general thoughts that we have about what happens with space weather and solar flares and what it affects. Like um, you can see a, a space station there. Um, obviously, uh, astronauts in space are sensitive to, to radiation associated with, uh, with solar activity. But there's a lot of other things like GPS, for instance, is something that I think a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and that's not just for navigation, also things like public works, road construction, farming use uh, GPS extensively. Then there's electric grids. Airlines like to fly over the poles for you know to uh, fly from one continent to another because it's short, uh, but you can't do that if there's, uh, uh, if there's solar activity that, you know, would cause a health danger to uh, flight crews. 
And then there's other things that happen in sort of longer time scales like satellite drag um, and uh, currents are induced in cables and pipelines that cause those pipelines and, and cables to corrode, for instance, or uh, they cause uh, undesirable effects because of uh, differences in potentials. So all of these things are driven and strongly impacted by space weather and space climate, which is a consequence of magnetic activity in the solar atmosphere. Things like flares and CMEs are you know, space weather effects and uh, the solar cycle as a, in general uh, affects things like you know, so, uh, uh, photochemistry in the Earth's atmosphere and um, satellite drag, and things like that. So we have really strong motivations to study solar magnetism. And this all started actually more than 100 years ago when Peter Zeeman discovered the Zeeman effect in 1896. He noticed that spectral lines were split in the presence of magnetic field. Um, it's interesting to note that he was actually working on something else and um, as sort of a Friday afternoon when he didn't want to go home, he decided to play around with the magnetic field and he noticed that the lines that he was observing would split into multiple components. It turns out that was actually observed before um, by Young in 1892 in the spectra of solar features. Uh, I don't know that Peter Zeeman was actually aware of this, um, but George Hale certainly probably was, and he uh, used a very primitive spectroporter in 1908 to determine that um, uh, sunspots are uh, actually magnetic. Um, this is a big discovery that there is ma a magnetic field in the solar atmosphere, and it sort of set off a, a, a long and arduous journey that has gotten us to this point today where we have spectropolarimeters that are very common and available at most observatories for solar observations. And we make routine observations from space now with spectropolarimeters as well. Um, really the development of, of digital sensors and increases in computing have enabled this, uh, this ability for us to diagnose magnetic field. As we'll get into later, uh, we'll, we'll learn a little bit about how we actually do this and, and why uh, computers are really instrumental and, and critical in, in doing this sort of work um, and why digital sensors are also very important. Now, um, spectral polarimetry has, has taken up such an important role in our field that four out of five of the first light instruments on the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope are spectral polarimeters. The only thing that isn't a spectral polarimeter is the broadband imagers, the, the VBI uh, red and the VBI blue, that's really one instrument in this list. Um, and they only uh, take pictures and movies, they do this very well. All of the other instruments, VISP, um, the, uh, virtual, uh, the Visible Tunable Filter, VTF, um, the Diffraction Limited Near Infrared Spectropolarimeter, DL NERSP, and the Cryo uh, Near Infrared Spectropolarimeter, Cryo NERSP, um, those four instruments are all uh, spectropolarimeters and they're all intended to diagnose magnetic field in different ways uh, in the solar atmosphere. So we're going to talk about this, but first we're going to go through a little bit of background of um, uh, what this really looks like. And, and uh, my understanding is that this audience here is maybe, you know, they're all scientists, but maybe not all versed in um, the details of solar physics and spectropolarimetry. So let's first take a look at um, a sunspot. Here it is. Um, this was actually taken with the Hinode satellite probably more than a decade ago now. Um, Hinode was the first uh, visible spectropolarimeter in space uh, developed by uh, Bruce Lights and people at HEO and, and Lockheed and uh, in Japan. And it really opened our eyes to what you can do with spectropolarimetry from space. If you have um, you know, really consistent data, it's kind of amazing. Like this to me is still blows me away how good this image is. Um, and this is just one slice of the cube of data that we have here. We have two spatial dimensions, X and Y, and one spectral dimension. Uh, and I'm just showing you the continuum image here because this is kind of what you know, people think about when you mention a sunspot. But in this case, since we have the spectrum and we have the polarimetric information, we can infer all kinds of really interesting information from this, such as the magnetic field. Um, so I'll show that here. Um, this is after we've processed that data to recover the magnetic field, you get uh, an image like this where um, blue is, is a strong field and red is a very weak field. So we can actually recover quantitative information out of this data. That's amazing. We can tell how much magnetic field there is in, in each of these locations and which directions is it pointing. Um, that's a very powerful tool for, uh, for studies of uh, all these, uh, these things that I was talking about earlier that turn out to be really important for, uh, for all the, well, really all of the, the important topics in solar physics these days have something to do with, uh, with magnetic field. So having the 
the ability to diagnose magnetic field is really critical um, for our field today. Um, while I'm giving this talk, the uh, helioseismic and magnetic imager on the Solar Dynamics Observatory will actually uh, diagnose the magnetic field in the solar atmosphere a couple of times probably um, over the entire solar uh, disk with a resolution of about one arc second. So here's a picture from a couple of days ago. I think this is December 1st. This is what um, the uh, uh, line of sight component of the magnetic field looked like at that, that time. And we can then go a little bit higher in the atmosphere so when I see a line of sight component, uh, what you're seeing here, uh, black and white indicate the direction away and towards you, uh, and gray means that um, there's no net field there. If we go a little higher in the atmosphere, we can kind of correlate this with uh, activity in the, uh, in the sun. You can flip back and forth between these, but you can, you'll notice that the places where there's magnetic fields, you can see a lot of this is a UV band. So there's a lot of UV radiation coming from those regions. Um, what else can we do with the magnetic field? Well, we can take it and we can, uh, for instance, do a field extrapolation and try to, to derive from the measurement that we had lower in the atmosphere, what the field might be higher in the, in the atmosphere and into the heliosphere. That's what's done here. So it, the HMI team does this you know, regularly. You can just go to the HMI website and download these images. That's what I did. Um, this is really amazing that we can do this uh, with this kind of fidelity and this kind of, uh, you know, regularity. We're doing this, you know, HMI does this every 15 minutes. It, it blows my mind. So when we're talking about diagnostics of magnetic field in the sun, there's really two broad categories we, uh, of diagnosing magnetic field. There's the qualitative measurements, such as proxy magnetometry and magnetograms. Those are relatively easy things to do. And when Hale first looked at, at his sunspot, he was essentially doing, uh, doing that. He didn't have a quantitative measure uh, of what the magnetic field was. He just knew that there was magnetic field and he knew that it was strong because he could see it um, with his primitive system where he was, you know, he didn't have a camera. He was the camera. He was looking through an eyepiece with a, a polarizer and noticing that uh, he saw a change in the intensity when he rotates the polarizer, which indicates that um, uh, there is a, a polarized component to the light. And that means that there is magnetic field. So that's what he did. Nowadays, what we're trying to do is quantitative measurements where we take the, the data that we have and we process it with, with inversion codes um, to derive actual quantitative measures of magnetic field, strength and orientation. Now, proxy magnetometry is much easier. It just relies on knowledge of uh, that certain features in the atmosphere uh, are magnetic in nature, let's say sunspots and, and faculae and G-band bright points. So um, here's a little video that kind of shows you that. On the left, we have um, the solar photosphere where we see the typical granulation pattern that is, uh, essentially this is the top of the convection zone of the, of the sun. And between the granules, you can see these little bright points. Um, and we know that those are associated with magnetic field. The reason why they're bright is because the, uh, uh, the field um, has uh, constitutes a pressure and that evacuates um, the uh, or creates a, a depression in um, in the solar surface there. So you're looking deeper where it's uh, hotter and therefore you see uh, a brighter signal. This is also in a molecular band and um, at those higher temperatures, the molecules dissociate, causing even less opacity. Therefore, you're allowed to see even deeper into the atmosphere, causing yet um, greater brightness enhancement. On the right, we're looking a little higher in the, in the solar atmosphere. This is a, a kind of a broadband calcium image where, again, we see bright points. Now, they're uh, again, they're bright because they're hot. Um, they're hot for a different reason in this case. But again, we can, we can use an intensity diagnostic to uh, infer locations of magnetic field in, uh, in these images. So this is a relatively straightforward way of going about it, but of course you don't know much about the magnetic field. You know that there is magnetic field, but you don't know which polarity it has, what direction it is pointing, how strong it is. So th there's a lot of information missing that we would love to have. Now, uh, here's another example um, that is uh, maybe more well known than, uh, than the, the photospheric bright points. This is the famous butterfly diagram where uh, plotted on the uh, uh, on the y-axis is positions of uh, sunspot latitudes of sunspots, and on the horizontal axis is time. And you can see the solar cycle very well depicted here. You can see the trend of uh, sunspots moving towards the equator, and then you can see the next cycle come up. So 
Um, this is, again, proxy magnetometry. And one of the things that you can't tell from this is that the solar cycle is actually 22 years, not 11, because the polarity inverts from one cycle to the other. So if uh, the predominant polarity in the north is, is, is let's say, uh, positive in, the, in one cycle, then it'll be uh, positive in the south in the next cycle. So it flips over every 11 years, but you can't tell because we don't have that information in this plot. We just see that there are some spots. We know that those are magnetic. So we know this is some kind of magnetic activity, but we can't tell that, that the cycle actually flips polarity every, uh, every 11 years. We can do some, something better, which is magnetogram. Uh, and they're essentially just Stokes V images. You sit in the line or the wing of a line and you look at the Stokes V signal and that relies on the Zeeman effect to show the line of sight magnetic field, but you still don't have a measure of strength, at least not a good measure of strength. This is a lot more powerful already. You can see here a, a movie from uh, the Hanodi mission um, from, again, from more than a decade ago now, um, where we see white and black dots in a gray background um, that indicate magnetic field locations, and it gives us a sense of the polarity of that magnetic field. So with something like this, what we can do, for instance, is we can uh, uh, apply a feature tracking, a feature identification algorithm, and find places where, uh, where the magnetic field is and do studies on, for instance, how often do we see uh, opposite polarities appearing close to each other? Um, you know, can we learn something from that? So you can already do a lot more with this um, than you can with just an intensity diagnostic um, at you know, a slight cost of uh, increased complexity of the instrument. But it's not huge, uh, and it gives us a lot more information. We've done this for quite a while now, but really the thing we want to do is um, study uh, you know, quantitative measures of magnetic field and use that to feed models and things like that to really get to the base of how do these, uh, how does all this solar magnetic activity happen? Where, you know, where does the magnetic field even come from? And uh, how do, for instance, flares and CMEs uh, happen? Because it's, flares and CMEs are quite interesting because they, they sit for a long time. Somehow you need to store a lot of magnetic fields, or sorry, a lot of energy in magnetic field that then for whatever reason happens to erupt at some time. So there's a lot of questions about how do you actually store all that energy and what causes it to erupt, for instance. And that's just one example of the many things that we'd like to study for which we need to know uh, quantitative measures of magnetic field in the solar atmosphere. So in order to talk to you about how uh, we diagnose magnetic field in the solar atmosphere, we need to learn a little bit about polarimetry. Um, I think probably most people know that light is polarized. So you probably have a pair of polarized sunglasses. Um, polarization really just describes the orientation of the electric magnetic wave, and it describes the, the orientation of that wave and the phase between the electric and magnetic components of the wave. Now, um, Polarization of light is affected by the physical circumstances in which that light was created. And uh, it's maybe not entirely accurate. Uh, at the bottom here, you can see an, an example picture of uh, some mud flats um, taken with and without a polarizer. On the left, there is no polarizer in, uh, on the camera and you can see all the reflected light off of the water that's on the mud flats. On the right, uh, a polarizer has been added and it's oriented so to uh, reject light that is polarized in the direction that it, it, uh, it has when it, it is reflected. And as you can see, all that light is now gone and you can actually see the mud flats much more clearly. So what happens when the light reflects off the, the surface is it introduces a preferred orientation and that it, uh, symmetry breaking uh, creates polarization in the light, which is then filtered out by the, the polarizer. So, um, by looking at the polarization of light, we can learn something about what happened to that light before it got to us. So how do we describe polarization? Well, every photon is fully polarized, um, but an incoherent source can be partially polarized. And in our field, when we're looking at the sun, uh, we're generally looking at um, an incoherent source of light. So we like to use the Stokes formalism. It's very commonly used in our field and also in astrophysics. And it describes the polarized light uh, with a four vector with four elements, the first being intensity, then two linear polarizations and one circular polarization. The, uh, the linear polarizations are essentially the horizontal minus vertical polarization for which we call Stokes Q, then um, the same thing but rotated 45 for Stokes U and circular polarization um, 
is uh, light turning this way, mine is light turning that way. Um, and this is all from the, the reference frame of the observer. So with these four components, we can describe um, a, a source of polarized light that is potentially partially polarized. If we're describing our light with a, a four vector, uh, sorry, a vector of four elements, then um, we can describe what happens to that light with four by four matrices. Um, this is called Muller calculus. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Um, let me see if I can, there we go. Can you see my cursor? I think you probably can. So here's, for instance, the, the Muller matrix of a polarizer. As you can see, if you put a, a Stokes vector in here, um, then what comes out, if you do this calculation, is a Stokes vector in which the first two elements, intensity and Q, are the same, and they are uh, the, uh, the average of the input intensity and Q polarization. And the U and V signals are going to be zero because they're zeroed out by this, uh, this matrix. So that what this does is it, it, um, it analyzes, if you will, the um, uh, linear polarization in Q into intensity, and it also analyzes intensity into Q. Um, here's a, another Muller matrix. This is for a retarder. Um, in this case, intensity and Q are not affected. Um, they are just diagonal elements of one, but um, Stokes uh, V uh, and Stokes U are rotated into one into each other. Um, you can also uh, describe, for instance, a rotation of your reference frame through a rotation matrix like this. So when we're working with, uh, with Stokes vectors, we use Muller calculus to uh, to describe what our system does to those st those Stokes vectors. To measure magnetic field in the solar atmosphere, we're going to observe polarized spectra and lines that are sensitive to magnetic field. And then we're gonna retrieve the magnetic field by uh, trying to invert, if you will, um, those observations to infer a, uh, a quantitative measure of the magnetic field. Here's an example of um, two very well-known lines, the, the two iron lines around 600, uh, 6302 angstrom. Um, they're very well known um, and used very commonly. For instance, the Hinode mission uses these two lines. Um, there's very good reason why we use these two lines, but all I really wanted to point out to you here is the kind of signals that you see when you observe those lines. So in this case, we see the two lines here. There's a sunspot actually in this region. There's two other lines here that are kind of conspicuous in that they are narrow and uh, don't show a lot of features. These are actually telluric um, water vapor lines. So they're formed in the Earth's atmosphere and not in the solar atmosphere. But since we look through the Earth's atmosphere, we still get these lines anyway. Um, you can see there's all kinds of little uh, wiggles in this line, that's Doppler velocities. And then if we look in the polarization, we can see that um, there is a strong signal in all of the, the Stokes components, Q, U, and V, in the sunspot. And outside of it, there is some signals predominantly in V and some in, uh, in Q and U in some places where it's strong enough to, to see. You can also see actually here in the intensity, the line is broadened. If you look then in polarization, particularly in V, you can see that it's actually split into components. Um, a, 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 in this case, a, a blue word component that is negative and a, uh, a negative in V and a, a, a red word component that is positive in V. That gives you a sense of the, uh, the direction of the magnetic field. To note, um, the Q and U polarization are symmetric and the V polarization is anti-symmetric uh, in the line shape. So we can use this sort of data to, uh, um, to infer magnetic field from uh, our observations, but we need to talk a little bit about how we actually observe. Um, see, the problem is detectors are two-dimensional, but our observational space is three-dimensional. We have two spatial and one spectral dimensions. So somehow we have to slice through this cube of, um, of three dimensions with our, our two-dimensional detectors. Now, typically we use things like spectrographs or wavelength tunable imagers. VISP is a spectrograph, the VTF, which will be hopefully installed at the DKIST in the, in the next year or two, uh, is a tunable filter. So they, they scan through the cube in different ways and there's pros and cons uh, to each one of those. Uh, but ultimately you're kind of limited by the number of pixels you have on your detector. You can try to be clever with things like image slicers, uh, 
Um, but there's just a lot of data to observe, a lot of pixels to, to observe. Um, I did the calculation yesterday for a full field of view VIS map at um, zero four arc second spatial resolution or spatial sampling. And you need 18 gigapixels to sample uh, all that data. So ultimately you're just gonna be limited by how many pixels you have. Um, for instance, the DL NERSP on uh, also an instrument for DKIST uh, has a, a, some kind of integral field unit on it, but as a consequence, they only see a very small area of the, um, of the sun at any given point in time. So um, inherently, because we have to do this slicing and because we have to also gather kind of a lot of photons in order to get good signal to noise, polarimetry is always going to be slow um, to some extent. Then the other problem is detectors are sensitive to intensity and we must encode this, these four elements of the Stokes vector into intensity measurements using polarizers and then decode it finally from those observations. So polarization is by necessity a difference measurement. And I should also point out that um, this is sort of tricky because intensity tends to be much, much higher than the polarization signal. So when we're looking for uh, small polarization signals, we're, we're taking the difference of two very large signals to find a very small signal. So this is usually sensitive to, uh, to noise. And as a result, we need to average and, and gather a lot of photons essentially to beat the, um, just the statistics noise of photon counting. Then the data interpretation process is also not hugely straightforward. Um, we can't just take a, uh, a, a Stokes profile from an observation and um, apply some mathematics to it and, in, uh, and just get a magnetic field out of that. Instead, we have to solve the forward problem. We're going to synthesize a line and compare that with the observation. And we're gonna repeat that until a match is found. Here is the kind of the simplest way that we might do this. Uh, it's called the Mill and Eddington approximation um, in which we have a, a pretty simple model of uh, the solar atmosphere with you know, a dozen or so parameters that feeds into a radiative transfer calculation, which outputs um, a synthetic spectra, radiation, if you will. We compare that to observations. We see, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. Let's try again. So we try some new parameters and we repeat this exercise until we find a good match. We're actually pretty good at doing this. It's um, applicable in many cases in the, in the solar photosphere, Miller Anton approximation is, um, and it's used very extensively. Hanode SP does this, SDOHMI does this. Um, a lot of ground-based observatories that do, um, uh, that observe the solar photosphere also use Miller Anton approximation. It's relatively inexpensive and it's relatively well behaved. We have a lot of experience with it, but it's still fraught with some dangers. Um, if you have a model with you know, a dozen or so parameters, you can't really expect that to have um, a, a very, you know, there's, there's maybe no obvious best solution. So it's very easy to get trapped in, um, in local minima, for instance. So you have to uh, first start by making, uh, for instance, some um, uh, ad hoc approximations or, or doing things like calculating from your, um, your observations using a magnetograph formula or something like that, uh, some starting position that you think is pretty close to, uh, to the actual solution that you're looking for. Um, and then you iterate from there using some kind of uh, optimization algorithm. So this is fairly doable nowadays. Um, and like I said, we do this you know, fairly regularly. So um, th this is something that we can certainly do. Um, as we uh, get towards uh, more complex things, in, and I'll talk about in the near future in the, in the next couple of slides, uh, this is gonna break down and it's gonna get much harder to, uh, to interpret the data. So. Let's talk now a little bit about um, uh, the visible spectropolarimeter for DKIST. So um, some key science objectives of the VISP that I wanna to touch on first before we really get into this are listed here and I, I don't really need to read them out, but um, what you'll notice is that a lot of these things um, are maybe not, the, knowing the, the magnetic field in the solar photosphere really isn't adequate. We're really looking for um, you know, in some cases it is, but in most cases it's not. For instance, for the emergence, evolution, decay of active regions, we really need to also know what's happening higher in the solar atmosphere. Precursors and triggers of flares for coronal mass ejections. Obviously, we need to know what's happening in the chromosphere where we're storing all this energy 
in the magnetic field. Um, it'd be great if we could know also the magnetic field in the corona even, because we would like to know how does mass and energy make its way into the solar wind, into the heliosphere. Um, but these things require measurements that are uh, of the magnetic field in higher layers of the atmosphere. So what does the solar atmosphere sort of look like? Well, here's a kind of a, a, a cartoon figure that you know, not really to scale, but sh shows you sort of what it looks like. What we've been doing so far, and what we've been talking about so far is mostly measuring the photospheric magnetic field really deep down here in, um, in the lowest layers of the atmosphere that we can observe in visible and, and infrared light. Above that, we have the chromosphere where um, uh, a lot of changes happen in terms of um, the, the balance between forces in the plasma forces and magnetic forces. Uh, then we go through the transition region, a very small, thin layer that is effectively a shock. Um, and then above that is the hot corona in which the magnetic field is, is very dominant. And you can see all these, uh, these clearly magnetically dominated structures. But again, we don't really have a good handle on the magnetic field there. So um, we know that the chromosphere is really, really important, um, but it's really hard to actually diagnose magnetic field in there. And it's also a region where the magnetic field is, is very complex, which is illustrated by this figure that I took from Ijima and Yokoyama, uh, who ran a model. Um, if I just gave you the photospheric magnetic field here, and even maybe I told you what the field looks like in, in, uh, in the corona, you'd have a really hard time figuring out that it was going to do this in the chromosphere. So the chromosphere is this region where the plasma and magnetic forces are approximately equal. You have lots of interesting interplay between the two things and, and many processes happen that are really critical for uh, all of the physics that we're trying to understand. Um, but we don't have a very good handle on what's happening here. So new instrumentation that's being constructed today uh, is predominantly focused on uh, finding ways to diagnose magnetic field in the chromosphere. Um, one of the things I should note is that um, I showed you this extrapolation of, of the vector magnetic field from the photosphere into the, into the heliosphere very early on in this talk. And it generally just doesn't work very well. If you were to take that image and look at that you know, critically, you'll notice that the, uh, um, the intensity from the EUV that you see doesn't really line up very well with the, uh, with the field lines that have been extrapolated from the photosphere. And it's really because the photosphere is not force-free. So we can't uh, assume like a force-free extrapolation and get a good answer. And then there's all this stuff that happens in the chromosphere that is not captured typically by those extrapolations either. So having a measure of um, what the magnetic field is sort of at the top of the chromosphere where it is force free would be very useful for understanding what the magnetic field in the heliosphere looks like. And that in turn would be important to understand how, for instance, a CME or a flare um, is going to uh, propagate through the, uh, the interplanetary medium and, and get to Earth and what uh, uh, what the magnetic field of that ejecta is going to be when it gets to us. So why is, uh, is this so hard? Well, um, once you get into regions of the solar atmosphere where, um, the, uh, where the density drops, radiation scattering becomes more important um, than just absorption and re-emission. So instead of um, the radiation being formed locally, it's actually formed non-locally and it's scattered um, from a, a location higher in the atmosphere towards us. So we can't assume local thermal equilibrium anymore. And then instead of having this fairly straightforward uh, way of interpreting the data, it's much more complicated where we have a model that is vastly more complicated with many, many more parameters. And instead of just being able to do a radiative transfer calculation to create the radiation output, we also have to calculate statistical equilibrium which uh, to find the atomic excitation, which in turn depends on the radiation output. So now you have this cycle here uh, that we have to iterate through in order to get a, a good output radiation in order to compare with our observations. So computationally, this already becomes you know, obviously a lot more intensive. Um, but the problem also is that the model now is much more complicated. There's vastly more parameters. So you have a lot more of these problems of local minima and non-convergence or, or issues like that. So, um, just the, the computational problem becomes much harder to deal with. Then um, we're not quite done yet. Density and temperature gradients also cause uh, anisotropy in the radiation. And any kind of symmetry breaking is going to produce polarization. In this case, what happens is that it creates um, 
imbalances in uh, the population levels in the atom, and that causes naturally polarized re-emission, even in the absence of magnetic field. There's some good news though, because if you have a weak magnetic field, uh, it doesn't have to be very strong, then the Hanley effect modifies this polarization signature. And uh, that means if we can know what it is, if there is a magnetic field, but we see some, something different, we might have a way of inferring what that magnetic field was. Um, and this is very nice because the Zeeman effect is, um, is mostly sensitive to stronger magnetic field. And in the chromosphere, the magnetic field is more diffuse and therefore weaker. So having a diagnostic for weaker magnetic field is, is very nice. Um, so there's great potential for combined Hanla Zeeman diagnostics um, to, uh, to apply those to magnetic field in the solar chromosphere. Um, and then there's other ways to overcome some of these challenges. We can have many line diagnostics. So we, instead of looking at a single, um, uh, single line uh, atomic transition line, we can look at many, many lines and use those together um, to remove ambiguities or uh, constrain our inversion results. When I showed you that data of those two iron lines, that's actually a very good example of that. What we do with those two lines is that we, uh, we know those two lines are, are formed under very similar circumstances in the solar atmosphere, but they have different sensitivities to magnetic field. And that allows us to differentiate between a case where we have a strong magnetic field that's highly localized um, in a, a, a pixel of our or resolution element of our observation versus a weak magnetic field that permeates that entire volume. Those two things will produce very similar looking data, um, but because those two lines have different sensitivities to the magnetic field strength, this using those two lines simultaneously allows us to, to um, remove that ambiguity between filling factor and field strength. Now, uh, in the last so many years, um, very sophisticated inversion codes have been developed. Um, STIC and DESIRE are two good examples of those. And they're uh, available and that you, know, you can just download them and go work with them. So this is really great. We're still working on the Hanley Zeeman diagnostics. Um, a code has been developed called Hanley RT, which has great promise. Right now it's mostly, mostly used as a synthesis code. So it doesn't do an inversion yet, but um, the synthesis is just a, really the first step towards um, an inversion uh, process code. Finally, um, machine learning techniques have really improved a lot. And they offer some promise to reduce the computational loads to manageable levels. Uh, as you might understand, you, with very complex models, very complex atoms that need to be calculated, these calculations can be very expensive. So if we can find a way to shortcut those, those calculations, um, that would be very helpful in processing the large volumes of data that we expect to receive from our, our next generation observatories, such as um, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, People have probably seen this figure before. Um, I just wanted to put it up here because it, uh, it gives a good overview of what the telescope really looks like. The DKIST or DKI solar telescope, I should say, um, is a four meter solar telescope. It's much bigger than solar telescopes that we've had to date. Um, it's a factor of three to five bigger than typical solar telescopes today. Um, and that brings with it some uh, unique challenges such as heat load on um, the, the heat stop and things like that. Uh, but it also gives great promise for instruments like VISP. Um, one of the problems that I mentioned before with, with doing polarimetry is that you need really good signal to noise. So even though the uh, DKI solar telescope, one of the primary reasons for, for having a four meter mirror, four meter aperture, is that we want to reach very high spatial resolution. For an instrument like VISP, um, we're actually not going to be operating at the diffraction limit of the telescope. We're operating at twice the diffraction limit because we're using the telescope as a light bucket. We just want photons, and we need those in order to get good signal to noise. So just kind of going through the telescope from uh, top to bottom, light comes in here at the top. It hits the primary mirror over here, approximately. Then it goes up here um, to the secondary and then makes its way through a number of mirrors down into this level, the Coudé level, where there is a uh, laboratory um, that is about 16 meters in diameter. Um, the DKIST is very, very large. Um, for astronomical you know, considerations, a four meter uh, telescope is really not that big, but you have to remember that this is a, an off axis design. So really the building is roughly equivalent to like a, a nine or 10 meter uh, observatory. And this is what it looks like. 
the thing is absolutely massive. Um, you can see a car here sort of for reference, and you should keep in mind that this car is actually a lot closer to you than this wall is. So um, when you first see this thing, I, I was blown away by how large it, 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 it actually is. Um, then let's talk a little bit about this Coudet level where all the instruments are. Um, this is a, a rendering from a little while ago. It's been updated since, but um, this is the last one I could find. What we can see here is the lights coming in from above. It hits a 45 um, uh, degree mirror, so a 90 degree reflection, and it folds a couple of times. Um, these are powered mirrors that produce a collimated beam. There is a, uh, a high uh, order adaptive optic system over here. Um, and then the light goes on to, uh, into this beam here and gets folded into VISP. This is the VISP over here. Uh, the adaptive optic system is over here. The broadband imager is over here. Um, and a couple other instruments are depicted here as well. This is the cryo NERSP. Um, this is the uh, visible tunable filter VTF and the DL NERSP is over here in the foreground. I'm gonna be talking about, um, about VISP here. And VISP is a, uh, is a research spectral polarimeter. It offers very high spatial resolution by virtue of being an instrument of um, a very large solar telescope. And it offers very good spectral resolution as well and continuous tuning capability over its spectral range. And it can observe three spectral regions simultaneously. So summarizing wavelength range 380 to 900 nanometers, uh, three simultaneous uh, lines can be observed. Spatial resolution, as I mentioned, is twice the DECUS resolution, 0.07 arc seconds at 630 nanometers, still very, very good. Um, field of view of two by two arc minutes, 120 by 120 arc seconds. Spectral resolution, better than about 180,000, and polarimetric capability um, is very uh, pretty good as well, 10 to minus three uh, polarimetric signal in 10 seconds. Actually, we outperform this, uh, this requirement considerably. Uh, typically, we can reach this in uh, in a few seconds. So, what are sort of the design challenges associated with uh, uh, with an instrument like this? Well, the first is that large telescopes require large instruments. We can't just take an existing instrument from a, a smaller telescope and put it on on the DKIST and um, expect that to work because the uh, the field of view would be uh, reduced if you um, if you did that in order to keep the angles on all the optics the same. So. In order to design a new instrument, you have to kind of get into the mode of thinking big. Um, uh, Spectre have design finally is also, or, or is also very constrained. Um, your plate skill is, it, or plate skill at the slit is driven by physical constraints on slit width. You can't manufacture slits that are very narrow. And even if you could, you don't really want that because um, once your slit gets, you know, to be, roughly equivalent to the, the wavelength of the light that you're observing, diffraction effects really become problematic. Um, so that sort of sets a plate scale at the, at the slit. Um, then you have a camera and uh, once you have your camera selected, you already know what the magnification needs to be in order to get the right uh, spatial resolution on your, your camera. Um, then once we start looking at things like our requirement for spectral resolution, spectral versatility, so the ability to tune to any wavelength in the visible range, continuous coverage, having three arms simultaneously, um, your grading selection is also very, very limited. Another challenge that we had with VISP um, is uh, that it needs to be automated in its setup. Uh, access to the instrument is limited. The Coudé laboratory is a clean room, um, and we'd like to be able to set it up pretty quickly and accurately. Um, back in the good old days, you would go to your telescope and you tell the observers, so well, these are the lines I want to observe. And they'd say, okay, well, we'll go set that up. And about a day later or so, they'd have their spectrograph uh, set up. We'd like to do that in about 10 minutes instead. That means that a lot of things are automated, they're motorized, um, which is great because it also allows for very fast reconfiguration. So you might be able to uh, uh, observe many different targets with uh, different setups, um, you know, in quick succession. We chose a, a, a traditional slit scanning shell spectrograph design. Uh, we have a library of photo etched slits that match the telescope resolution at a number of different wavelengths um, in order to be able to get the photon flux that we need. If we're looking, for instance, at dim structures, we also have uh, extra wide slits that could be used for uh, off limb structures if we if we wanted to look at those. Um, we also have three arms uh, for our three uh, simultaneous uh, wavelength regions, and those three arms are, are virtually uh, 
identical. Here's a uh, uh, overview of the optical design. So the light comes from the Dekist um, light distribution system called FIDO and hits our three um, uh, feed optics that make an image on the slit. As you can see, this image is actually tilted. That's done on purpose. What I've omitted here is a beam dump that's about over here. Um, there's a lot of light coming off of this uh, off of this slit that was not going into the spectrograph and it needs to go someplace. So that's absorbed um, and, uh, and removed from the optical system that way. And then uh, behind the slit is a fold mirror and the polarization modulator that I haven't talked about, but it's an integral aspect or an integral component of any polarimeter. Then there's a fold mirror station uh, collimator that collimates the light onto the grating, and then it is dispersed into the three spectral arms. Um, to note, uh, one thing is the, uh, the focal length of the sp three spectral arms is different. That's done um, uh, for, uh, in order to preserve the spectral resolution in those arms. Um, typically, the, uh, the third arm, this one, for instance, is at a greater angle, of course, than the first arm. Um, and in order to keep the same spectral resolution, you need to have um, higher magnification in that arm. Oh, sorry, lower magnification in that arm, higher magnification in the first arm. Uh, mechanically, it looks more or less like this. This is a render courtesy of uh, Andrew Carlisle, um, uh, our, one of our engineers. Uh, this doesn't show the, the beams of light, but the light comes in over here, hits the, fold mirror, or the first feed mirror, second feed mirror, third feed mirror, makes an image on the slit, and then goes into the spectrograph. Here's the grating, and here are the three camera arms. Those camera arms can move on this rail system over here, which is, uh, I'll show you a picture of what it actually looks like in the next slide. Um, that rail system is, is very large, but very important to the, uh, the, the versatility of the instrument. Uh, it's motorized, so the arms move, um, uh, autom or are automated to move on this rail system. It's concentric to a very high degree with the, uh, with the grating. That allows us to set up the spectrograph very quickly and accurately to observe any spectral region that we would like to see between 380 and 900 nanometers. Here's a picture of what it looks like in the Coudé lab. So you can see in the front here, the three um, spectral arms. You might notice these uh, uh, lenses are square. That's done so that the arms can approach each other very closely, which is very important for the spectral diversity or versatility, if you will. Uh, of the instrument. If you can put your arms really close together, that means you can access spectral regions that are, uh, that are close together. If you make them round, you would lose a lot of um, space between the arms and uh, that would impact our ability to observe um, as many spectral regions as possible in the, um, in the 380 to 900 nanometer passband. Cameras are back here. Uh, there's the collimator lens over here and you can see the grating over here. Um, if we look from the other direction, we're now looking at the slit optic here, which is a, a reflective, it's a mirror uh, on which five slits are etched. Um, there's actually some light on the mirror here right now. This is uh, during setup, we were feeding light through the telescope from the Gregorian optical system. So it actually shows you uh, essentially what the field of view looks like on, um, uh, on the mirror. This is about a hundred millimeters in diameter or so. Behind here, you can see again the, the three spectral arms. The grating is covered up here under its little protective cover. And over here, you can see one of the feed mirrors. Um, it's a little hard maybe to get a sense of scale here, um, but all of this is, is fairly large. Um, the, uh, the lenses are uh, about, I wanna say 12 centimeters high and maybe uh, eight or so centimeters wide for the collimator. Um, and as the, you get to the third arm, they're more or less square at you know, 15 by 15 centimeters or so thereabouts. Um, this rail system, as you can see, is also very, very heavy. We need that in order to uh, ensure the stability of the instrument that's uh, required for high resolution imaging. Let's see, here's a little video that maybe gives you an idea of what this thing looks like. Remember that this is a 16 meter um, laboratory and it actually rotates. Uh, this is done so that you can compensate for the rotation introduced by the alt azimuth mount. It also allows VISP to orient the slit uh, in any direction that it, it wants on uh, the sun. So we can choose which orientation we want for the slit, which might help us scan a smaller area, for instance. And that's helpful because that means we can scan our target of interest faster um, than if it's fixed in orientation. <laughs> 
one of the things that you run into when you design an instrument like this um, is that actually using it to observe um, three spectral regions that you're interested in um, it requires a, a particular setup and it's not so easy to figure out how you should set it up by hand. So to help with that, we designed this, uh, this instrument performance calculator that allows you to explore configurations of the instrument. What's shown here is the science verification configuration, which is also the configuration that's uh, used for uh, the first science observations. Um, it has the 630 nanometer lines in arm one. It has calcium to uh, K, is this K? I think it's K, in uh, arm two. And um, one of the infrared calcium lines, 8542, uh, angstrom in the third arm. Um, we chose this setup because it spans uh, essentially the range of possibilities that this can access. You know, the, the blue or, or the most UV lines um, that we're interested in are the calcium lines in the UV, and the red most lines that we're generally interested in for chromospheric diagnostics at least are the calcium lines again um, around 850 nanometers. The iron lines are, you know, as I mentioned, very commonly observed. We have um, you know, existing codes and, and we know what to expect there. So that seemed like a really good addition as well. So this is what we chose for our science verification. It's also a very powerful combination of lines for science in general. So that's why it's being used for uh, the first science observations. In order to find a configuration, uh, the instrument performance calculator comes with an optimizer that you can use to, uh, you can ask it to uh, produce a, a configuration based on the number of lines that you would like to observe. It calculates the most optimal configurations possible and gives you, uh, you know, the ability to explore those configurations with, uh, with this interface. There's a large parameter space that needs to be optimized. So again, very difficult to do by hand. You need to calculate a grading tilt angle, arm positions, and spectrograph orders. So uh, doing this by hand is really not tractable. Uh, but fortunately, the, uh, the IPC is very good at it, and uh, we've had very good results. Um, you know, uh, it seems to perform very well and seems to predict very well what the, the instrument's actually going to do. So uh, with that, let me show you some of the, uh, the first data from VISP, um, which is hot off the presses. This is uh, uh, very recently, we've closed out the construction phase of VISP now that VICUS is going into operations that um, and we're, uh, we're preparing a, a paper with uh, uh, details about the instrument. And some of the, the data that we're going to show in there is from the, uh, the science verification campaign. Um, what I'm showing here is uh, line core images and nearby continuum in um, the iron lines and the UV calcium and in the infrared calcium line. So what you can see is uh, sort of in the continuum, the more or less expected scene of a sunspot. And you can actually see some granulation around it. Um, at least for the iron lines and for the, uh, the infrared calcium line. In the UV calcium, the line is very, very wide. If we look here, you can see that we don't really get to the continuum with the, the bandwidth that we have. So you actually see a little bit of uh, the proxy noise photometry diagnostic still. The magnetic field is a little bit brighter here um, and, and more obvious than it is in the other two images. Then in the line cores, we see uh, uh, seen higher in the photosphere with some reverse granulation in the iron lines. And we see a very typical chromospheric scene in the calcium lines where uh, the, the structure is more uh, wispy and elongated and filamentary, which is indicative of the, the importance of the magnetic field in the chromosphere. These are uh, intensities only, um, but of course we have uh, polarization. This shows you the, uh, the full range of, uh, of the first uh, arm around the iron lines. The iron lines are, are these two and actually the previous data that I showed of the two iron lines was actually a cutout from this, um, from this figure. Um, there's a couple other lines here that are also interesting for various reasons. Uh, one in line to note, for instance, is there's an oxygen line in here that is uh, sometimes used for um, determining the oxygen abundance in, in the sun, which is a very important thing for, uh, for various uh, things or for various fields, also astrophysics, because um, uh, oxygen essentially is the, uh, the barometer for all of the other element abundances. Uh, some more data here um, showing some cutouts. Actually, these are at the locations indicated by these arrows, one in the sunspot and one in the more quiet region. In the sunspot, we see um, that uh, here are the two iron lines, that they're clearly broadened. And actually, the, 
this iron line is, is clearly split into uh, its constituent components with uh, the expected polarization signal, a mostly symmetric signal in Q and U and an anti-symmetric signal in V as expected. In the quiet sun instead, you can see that um, there really isn't much of a signal to detect at all. Um, it's just basically noise. And that, that noise is at you know, uh, a, fraction of a, a fraction of a percent um, uh, in the polarization signals. Uh, I'll end with this figure, which is maybe a little bit more um, difficult to interpret, but it shows the, uh, the total polarization in the sunspot, which is clearly high. Uh, this is actually net linear polarization, I should say, and this is the uh, a total polarization measure as a ratio against intensity. This sunspot was fairly close to the limb, um, about 80% of the way to the limb, so you have a lot of linear polarization because of projection effects. We can use that to calculate in this figure shown um, uh, a, uh, an, an azimuth angle of the magnetic field, for instance, and we could process this data with inversion codes and get, um, uh, get quantitative information from uh, these data on the magnetic field in the sunspot. I think I'll end there. Uh, I see there's a couple messages in the chat, so let's see uh, if anybody has questions. Well, thank you very much, Alfred. I, I have asked uh, Jose Marquez to help us with the questions. Is a colleague from us. There are a couple of questions here in chat. Uh, okay, can I can I read the questions or if the if he is present here can open the mic and ask himself. Prince yeah. Pras Prasad ask uh, uh, the some some spots are, are manifestation of solar magnetic fields. Some spots are cyclic. We know that solar cycle uh, and now. So the solar magnetic field uh, to shall be cycling. Can you tell? Can you please tell the reason why solar magnetic field is cycling? No, no. Uh, we uh, <laughs> we, we don't really know. Um, right. uh, so this is a uh, it was really a question about the dynamo of the sun, and I'm certainly not the uh, the person to ask about this. I'm not an expert on this, but um, the general consensus is that. Uh, uh, so we know that there is a dynamo, but we don't um, we don't have a very good idea of, of uh, exactly how it operates, nor why it produces a, an eleven year cycle. Um, the sun appears to be kind of odd if you compare it to other stars that um, are similar in size and uh, and with similar rotational periods, um, in that it, it uh, has a very fast cycle. Eleven years is much shorter than what we typically see for other stars. Um, there's a lot of questions about. How that works and um, you know, where the cycle comes from to begin with. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, and I don't think really anybody has an answer. Um, an active topic of research. All right, that's it. So uh, Adriani uh, asked, beside DK IST size, what is the biggest challenge to estimate in the VISP Miller matrix? Right, this is a question about um, calibrating the instrument, right? So the, the problem with, with polarimeters is that we're trying to, to measure the polarization signal with an accuracy of a part in a thousand or so. Um, that means that we need to know very accurately what our instrument did to, um, to this, the, the incoming Stokes vector. And that's not our, just our instrument, it's also the telescope. So we need to know um, if a Stokes vector comes into the telescope, what is that Stokes vector when it actually gets to our camera? Um, that uh, fortunately was something that uh, another team has worked on. Um, there was a, uh, I think, a, uh, a talk by uh, Stacy Suoka uh, two days ago for mm -hmm. the SPIE meeting. Um, they've done a lot of work. And uh, so typically the way we do this is we calibrate our, our, our telescope and our instrument um, by injecting known Stokes vectors um, into the system and then measuring the response of the, of the instrument. Um, that works very well, um, except that the DECAS is just too large. You can't inject a Stokes vector into the telescope because it's very difficult to create a beam that's four meters in diameter with known um, Stokes signal. Um, right. So they've approached that in various different ways. Um, we can inject Stokes vectors at the Gregorian optical focus. So that's pretty high up in the telescope. Really the only two elements that are not characterized this way are the primary and secondary mirror. 
uh, those are characterized in, in different ways um, using modeling and uh, other approaches. Um, so that characterizing the telescope is actually a very large challenge and very difficult. Um, the other problem is that everything moves, right? The telescope yeah. points at the sun, so it tracks the sun. And that means that actually its characteristics change as a function of time. Um, so yes. you need to know not I, only- I, I would ask that um, if the changes in the, the telescope's um, distance would affect that nose. But yeah, this and is my it, own, yeah. And, um, and it does. Um, right. So uh, you could probably have uh, at least one or, or several talks about that um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how you deal with that. Uh, uh, to, to even learn the, the basics of it. Um, yes. it, it it's pretty hard. Um, and I feel like the, the DECAS team has done a very, very good job of uh, studying this and figuring out how to do it. And in my opinion, the DECAS is really the first telescope uh, of its size for which this sort of work has been done and, and it's really been properly studied um, in, in terms of what it does to the polarization. And as a result, uh, I, I think we're going to see some really impressive um, you know, polarization calibration results coming out of this, where you know, the, the work that we did with uh, in this, during science verification was kind of the first time that we were really looking at this data. And it works impressively well already, considering that you know, this is really the first time we were looking at actual sunlight um, nice. the instrument. So yeah. All right. So another question, Jean Santos asked, which is the minimal magnetic field intensity that can be detected by the ISP? And which is a temporal resolution. And he asked another question, how will the observation campaigns in data access work with DKI? Um, so the, uh, the minimum magnetic field depends on which line you choose to observe. Um, and uh, temporal resolution depends on the, the configuration of the spectrograph. In general, um, we can get to a single to noise of a thousand or, or better in a few seconds. Um, uh, and a signal to noise of a thousand in the photosphere will give you a, a field strength of a couple of gauss, at least along the line of sight. Um, so uh, pretty accurate. Um, you could integrate for longer and sacrifice uh, temporal resolution for uh, you know, uh, diagnostic potential, essentially. Um, access to the data, um, you can, uh, the first uh, observations are, there's a campaign that's starting now. They uh, put out a call for proposal or Call, yeah, call for proposals. They received, I think, 100 um, applications. 50 of those were selected. Um, so they'll be executing those programs. And that data will be given to the, uh, the proposers of uh, those programs for six months. And then it will be made publicly available through the DECAS data center. All right. So uh, I have another question here. Gulam Mustafa. How much the measurement of local magnetic topology will help to understand origin of flares and CME from VISP? I think we'll make a, a really a, a very great leap forward with, with VISP. Um, not only is the, uh, the spatial resolution very good, but also the mode of, in which it's being operated um, allows us to respond more quickly to uh, the changing sun. It's not that we allocate uh, or the I should say the DECAS team, because we were just building an instrument for them, um, but they've, uh, they've opted for this service mode um, uh, uh, of observations in which uh, trained observers at the telescope operate the telescope and they can choose to do uh, observations not based on who is scheduled to, to you know, be at the telescope at, during that time, but just from a list of, uh, of, of programs that they need to execute. Um, so if they see a nice target that might flare, uh, they might choose to observe that instead of doing something else. Um, the, uh, my hope is that they'll be able to, to capture um, some really awesome observations of, uh, of active regions pre, post, and during flares. Um, VISP will provide uh, data at unprecedented um, you know, detail and um, accuracy for these uh, these. Uh, these kinds of targets that we really haven't had before. Um, so I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to learn a lot from, uh, from DKIST and VISP uh, about the origins of flares, how they happen, when they happen. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, we should be a little bit careful uh, to not over, uh, you know, over promise. Um, DKIST is really intended for um, studies of very fine scales. And we do know that uh, flares and CMEs build up over very long periods of time. The energy builds up over very long periods of time on larger scales. 
that the DECAS is not well suited to observe. So um, it's not, DECAS isn't gonna do everything, but I think it will do a lot of, of really awesome science and we'll learn a lot about flares and CMEs. Exactly what, I'm not sure, but I'm sure we'll learn a lot of really great things. All right. So these are the questions we have here on the chat. If someone would like to open the mic and ask some something, please. I see that. Uh, uh, there's another yes. one here. All right. Uh, our coordinate campaigns with IRS uh, as planned for sunspot and light bridge. I, I can only imagine Iris. the answer. I can only imagine the answer is yes. Um, so coordinating with uh, with spaceborne observatories is always a little tricky because they have to plan uh, in a day or two in advance um, for their observations. Um, that said, you know, oftentimes the targets are fairly obvious, right? We're going to be looking at the most interesting active region, and everybody's going to be looking at that. So even if there's not a coordinated campaign, it's very likely that there will be uh, observations simultaneously of the same target on a regular basis. I would also uh, I, I think there's um, several of the people that are involved with IRIS have proposed observations with, uh, with the DKI solar telescope. So I would be surprised if they are not giving very high priority to coordinating with IRIS. All right. So have you uh, access to your operation plans by, by day by day? Uh, no, this, the operations are really run by uh, the, the DKIST team and uh, not so much by the VISP team. We, uh, we built the instrument. Uh, we're very excited to do science with the instrument. We support um, the DKIST team to you know, operate the instrument, but they, uh, they do the daily operations and they decide what to, what to point at. All right. Can I ask a question also? Okay. Sure. You, you have uh, other adaptive optics also for the instrument, no? But uh, uh, how, do, how do you deal with the vibrations of the uh, laboratory itself? Because it's moving also, no? Yeah, so um, the adaptive optics does some of that, of course. Um, but, uh, well, you have to design your observatory um, so that those vibrations are, are handled. Um, the uh, uh, the entire CUDE table is, is quite stable. It actually uh, rotates on a, a rail system very similar to the rail system that uh, the FISP arms move on. Um, uh, it's designed to be very smooth and, and it is. Um, vibrations can still be a problem, um, but it's, uh, it, uh, it's not something that you know, we as instrument builders were really concerned with. It was more the, uh, the, uh, the telescope team that, uh, that was working with those. Um, some of the things to be careful with are uh, the air handling system in a clean room, for instance. So yeah, there's a lot of places where vibrations can be problematic. Um, and uh, you know, we'll have to see if there's any vibrations that are, are problematic and what to do about those when we find them. I think that we have a final question. Yeah. What is a special resolution? of the first light risk data compared to expectations? <clears throat> so um, uh, if the adaptive optic system is able to lock, um, we expect very good results. Um, uh, so this depends on atmospheric seeing conditions, um, which are variable, of course, and, and unpredictable. Um, so like any other uh, ground-based solar telescope or even any ground-based telescope, you're subject to whatever the atmosphere decides to give you that particular day. Um, on good days, we should definitely be able to reach um, twice the diffraction limit, uh, assuming that the adaptive optic system is capable of locking uh, for some time. And uh, the DKI ST team did a site survey in which they looked at a number of different sites. And so you could go look at that and figure out how often that's going to happen. It's not gonna be terribly common, but it's also not gonna be uncommon. Um, our good fortune is that we're operating at twice the diffraction limit. So we're not as sensitive as uh, instruments like the VBI that are trying to reach the full diffraction limit of the telescope. Also, Alfred, I would like to thank you very much for this very nice talk. As you mentioned, we could have several of them it's so interesting to, to learn about this new telescope and all challenges that you have for the observations, calibration, and even 
the data processing later on. So I'd like to thank you very much and all colleagues that attended the seminar. And uh, if you have any questions, we can you can write us and we can follow to you or can write directly to you. Yeah, um, thank you very much for uh, having me give this talk. If there is uh, anything else that people want to know about VISP, don't feel uh, you know feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to uh, um, yeah happy to talk to you about anything you might want to know. Well, thank you very much to all. Let me and go then... back to my first slide. Maybe I can show you there. People can see. Oh, I didn't even put my email address on here. All right. Well. Uh, <laughs> You can uh, you can Google me and you can find me. I'm sure. Okay, I hope next time you can join us here at the EMP for a personal talk. Uh, that would be fun. I would I would enjoy doing that. I think. <laughs> okay, so so I will close here. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>